chapter 17. Philip, did you ever see a movie called The Defiant Ones? Those are the first words I said upon regaining consciousness in the back of that cab. <coughs> you talking to me, Dickhead? Those are the first words I heard upon regaining consciousness in the back of that cab. My entire body hurt a lot. Like, I imagine it would hurt if I somehow happened to roll off a huge rock and onto the ground while tethered to an obnoxious forensic plumber who I was now trying to have a conversation with. It's a movie where two escaped prisoners who hate each other are shackled together but have to cooperate in order to survive. And did you ever see a movie called Tom Thumb? asked Peckerman. I suggest you take yours and shove it up your ass. There's something out of whack with that retort. My tum thumb wasn't a discussion I felt like having at that exact moment. But for the record, let me just say that it was far beyond idiotic. The sun was up, a new day for everyone else, but for me, a continuation of the nightmare that was yesterday. We were still tied together. My stomach pressed against his back, so we were sitting there sideways, each with our right butt cheek on the seat, looking out the same window. At first, I couldn't get my bearings, but when I saw Lincoln Center, I knew we were on 9th Avenue heading downtown. May I ask where we're going? Home, said Peckerman, with an inflection implying that I had asked a question with an obvious answer. Are you sure that's a good idea? I asked. You have a better one? Ass plunge. Well, let me put it this way, I said. Do you live in a brick ranch house with a crab apple tree on your front lawn and a mailbox the shape of a locomotive at the curb? You know I do. You came to the house last night and kicked the shit out of my swell with your bullshit Prius. Remember? Yes, but it was dark, so this is actually the first time seeing it during the daytime. Nice place. What the hell are you talking about? Take a look to your left, I told him. He did. And now saw what I was seeing on the TV screen embedded into the back of the driver's seat. A newscaster was standing in front of Peckerman's house interviewing his neighbors. I never liked him, said a heavyset woman walking at St. Bernard. He's a foul-mouthed blowhard, and he never returned our rake. So, when I know he's not home, I let Winston here squeeze out a brown beauty onto his front lawn. Everyone does. The kids call this place Dutyville. The news then switched to the front of my house where a similar media circus was taking place. Cameraman running alongside the cars taking my kids to school. Pictures of me and Daisy as volunteers at a local soup kitchen last Thanksgiving. And then <clears throat> they cut to a reporter standing in front of the wine shop asking some of the other store owners questions about me. Did I ever think Corkman was capable of doing this, said Marty Jeff, who owned the Bagel Chateau tours down. Yes, I knew it the minute I saw that his lower lip drooped slightly on the left side. If I'm not mistaken, Lee Harvey Oswald had that same droop. And then that reporter turned back to the camera and said something about a reward for our capture or knowledge of our whereabouts. Still think we should go home, I asked Peckerman. I did so return that fat fuck's rake, he said with daggers in his eyes. How much do you want to bet three quarters of this shit on my lawn is hers? It would have been extremely difficult to get back to New Jersey anyway, because the news mentioned checkpoints at every outbound river crossing. In fact, up ahead I could see that the 9th Avenue entrance to the Lincoln Tunnel was already backed up. Change of plans, I shouted to the driver, and make the next right turn. Okay, I will, I promise, said the cabbie on the verge of tears. What's with him? I asked Peckerman. He's scared. He thinks I have a gun. And why would he think that? I asked. Because of this, said Peckerman, as I followed his gaze downward and saw he was holding a gun. Then he filled me in on what had occurred after my head crashed against the cement sidewalk. <clears throat> about the thugs taking our wallets, about the thugs being chased away by big black bears, about him hopping away from the big black bears up to a cab on 5th Avenue and about discovering that he had the thug's gun and it all made perfect sense. Now, the question was what to do next. 
I love to get out of these ropes, said Peckerman. I felt the same way. Peckerman had a small mole. It kind of has little black hair sticking out of it on the back of his neck, and I truly felt I'd used it more than my allotted time to stare into that thing. <clears throat> and it was only fair to let someone else enjoy the view. Pull over here, I told the sobbing cab driver in what appeared to be a deserted West Side Street with dilapidated buildings and unused loading docks. It bothered me this poor guy was so upset, so I tried to calm him down a little with calm him down with a little small talk to show him we were human and despite Peckerman's gun meant no harm. That's a nice picture of your children, I said about the photo that was taped to the dashboard. But my good intentions were misinterpreted as he apparently perceived that to be some kind of threat to his family. Whereupon he stopped the car, got out, came around to the back, opened the door for us, reached in, and untied us. Then, once Peckerman and I got out, <clears throat> stepped onto the street, the still sobbing cabbie ran back to the driver's side, opened his door, reached inside, grabbed something, ran around the cab, handed me a cigar box, then ran back to his side of the cab, got in, closed the door, and drove away. I opened the cigar box and looked inside. It was cash. $74.38. Probably all the money the cabbie made that day. I felt horrible. Peckerman. You know, I don't think this counts as robbing the guy because we didn't ask him for any money. He said the putz gave it to us voluntarily. I looked at Peckerman and felt the distinct urge to smack him, but we had bigger fish to fry. Plus, he was holding the gun. Then, as if on cue... The sound of approaching sirens was followed by three NYPD cars roaring around the corner. My stomach dropped, like back in school when the teacher's voice saying my name startled me out of an effective daydream. We both turned around, our backs to the street. The wailing of the sirens became slightly less insistent. The speed of the car is seemingly slower than just a few seconds before. <clears throat> My head down, I wondered if it was possible that Peckerman was actually peeing into his shoes. And then, as if they got in a second wind, the cars sped up again and headed towards some other place. After the few seconds it took to settle nerves, I garnered the strength to speak again. It's obvious we can't just stand out here like this. Any thoughts? Well, said Peckerman, I'm wondering if there's a way we can leave Manhattan other than by a bridge or a tunnel. Huh? I like to remind you, Mr. Peckerman, that Manhattan is an island, which <clears throat> by definition means that it is surrounded by water, so they need things like bridges and tunnels to attach them to other places. That said, how else do you suggest we get out of here? How about... Peckerman didn't bother finishing his sentence. He merely pointed across the highway to the piers that jutted out into the Hudson River where the SS Windsong a cruise ship to vacation spots in the Caribbean was boarding passengers. Chapter 18, Jeffrey. <clears throat> Come on, I said, staring toward the ship. Wait a minute, said Horkman. I turned around, ready to shoot the asshole. What? Maybe we should turn ourselves in. What? Look, we didn't actually do anything, right? They think we tried to bomb the GW Bridge, but we didn't. They also think we shot a cop. We didn't do that either. Right, but the fucking helicopter came down and they think we didn't. Yes, but we know we didn't. If we got good lawyers given time, we could get this all sorted out. Otherwise, if we just keep running, where do we stop? I hated to admit it, but the asshole had a point. So, what are you suggesting, I said. <clears throat> we make a call, he said. I know a good defense attorney. <clears throat> we contact him and he helps us turn ourselves in. That way we don't look guilty. We were a few yards from a coffee shop. I stuck the gun in my pocket and we went in. Two guys behind the counter were waiting on a half dozen customers, but nobody looked our way. A TV behind the counter was showing the news, but at the moment we weren't on it. We spotted a payphone back by the restrooms and headed that way, keeping our heads down. Horfman picked up the phone, keeping his face toward the wall. I grabbed a newspaper off a table and held it in front of my face. 
Pretending to read it while I peeked over the top and scanned the room, my eyes fell on the TV screen. Ah, shit, I said. What, said Horkman, look. The TV screen said terrorists and pervert sex zoo massacre. Ah, shit, said Horkman. Everybody in the coffee shop was staring at the TV. A counter guy turned up the volume. She's got any details on this horrific crime, the announcer was saying. Police have released this video from surveillance cameras at the Central Park Zoo. We warn you that some of what you are about to see is graphic and, quite frankly, disgusting. And there we were on the screen, me and him, in grainy black and white, tied together, with me hopping and Horkman's head jerking up and down. Police have identified these two men as Peckerman and Horkman, the same two suspected members of a New Jersey terrorist cell, being sought a connection with the attack on the George Washington Bridge and the gruesome shooting of a courageous NYPD helicopter pilot. It is not yet known exactly what the two men were doing at the zoo, but one police source speculated that they were engaging in some kind of sick, twisted sexual bondage victory dance. Now they replayed the video and slowed it down, so Horkman and I were bouncing in slow motion. You couldn't really see Horkman's eyes, but his mouth is opening and closing with every hop. I was gasping for air, but on the video, it almost looked like I was smiling. That's disgusting, said one of the coffee shop customers. But what is truly disturbing, said the TV announcer, is what happened next. Apparently, there were some youths at the zoo, and they had the misfortune to stumble upon this sordid scene. Youths, I said. Youths? I said a little too loud. One of the customers, a guy in a Yankees cap, glanced my way. According to police, the announcer said the bodies of two youths were found near the scene, disemboweled, and being eaten by bears. Sources have identified these as Central Park Zoo bears, Hansel and Gretel, which were brought to New York by Mayor Bloomberg as part of an animal exchange program with the Berlin Zoo, which for its part received porcupines. It is not clear at this point whether the terrorists deliberately set the bears loose to kill the youths or if they disemboweled the youths themselves and then set the bears on them in an attempt to cover their tracks. Yankee Cap glanced back at me again for a second longer this time. What is clear, continued the announcer, is that this new sickeningly horrendous act on the part of these alleged terrorists, perverts, who are still at large, has the entire city, and, yes, the entire nation, on edge. That is especially true of the police department, which very nearly lost one of its own in a savage attack by these same alleged depraved killers. For more on that, we go to reporter Warren Pristine, who's on the west side, with members of the police special anti-terrorism unit. Warren, what's the mood like out there? <clears throat> the screen showed a guy in a trench coat in front of a bunch of pissed off looking cops wearing helmets and body armor and carrying guns the size of piano legs. Steve, said the reporter, the mood among these officers is tense and, quite frankly, angry about the brutal and, as you say, savage attack on one of their own. As one officer said to me, and here I quote, cleaning up his language just slightly, if you shoot one of us in the testicles, it's like you shot all of us in the testicles, even the women. So there's a lot of anger, Steve, anger and rage. I'm speaking only for myself here, and I am certainly not suggesting that any of these brave and highly professional men and women would deliberately violate departmental regulations. But if they do encounter these alleged terrorists, and we all fervently hope they do, and soon, it would not surprise me if their tactical philosophy could best be summarized as shoot first and ask questions later. Back to you, Steve. Thanks for that report, Warren, said Steve, and be careful out there. To summarize, as the terror campaign against the people and zoo animals of New York City escalates and takes a twisted, disturbing turn, 
Police as well as federal agents are intensifying their search for two suspected terrorist leaders, Jeffrey Peckerman and Philip Workman. And there we were on the screen, this time sharp and clear in living color. Now Yankees Cap was staring at me. Hey, he shouted, hey! I had the gun out. Don't move, asshole, I said. You better listen to him, said Workman, because he will shoot you in the balls. Five seconds later, we were out the door, running toward the ship. Chapter 19, Philip. <clears throat> so the hope was that the 1,200 or so passengers now boarding the SS Winsong had been up most of the night packing, grabbed maybe a couple hours sleep, and then groggily left their homes at dawn to get to Pier 92 by 7 a.m., making it feasible they hadn't had the time to see the morning news with their pictures plastered all over the place. The ship's personnel are going to be a different story. Do you have a valid passport on you? Asked Peckerman while we were running toward the cruise ship. You're going to want to see one before we board. No, Peckerman. Call me nearsighted, but when I left my house to drive the two miles to my pet shop, I didn't consider the possibility that I'd be sailing upon international waters before I got home. I have mine. You have your passport on you? I asked. In here, he said, pointing to a zipper in the, on the leg of his dockers. Those guys in Central Park never bothered looking in this pocket. I just realized it was still in there. <clears throat> Why is it in there to begin with? Last summer, my, mom, uh, my wife and I went to Spain for our anniversary. These were the pants I wore on the flight home. I guess I never took the passport out of there. Well, there's a bit of good luck, but that today is the first day you've worn these pants since last summer. You kidding? I wear these pants all the time. They're real comfortable. Good thing I didn't wash them, though. Would have ruined the passport. <clears throat> so you haven't cleaned these pants since last summer? Uh, way before then, I wear them almost every day in Spain. Lovely. I knew from the few times Daisy and I went on cruise ships that they just want to see that you have a passport so there won't be a problem with customs once you get to your destination. <coughs> they don't run checks on them. So if Peckerman simply flashes the captain or the admiral or the chef or Whoever the hell that guy dressed in the white uniform at the top of the ramp leading to the ship's deck was, he would be fine. But what about me? Since our wallets were stolen, I didn't even have the two alternate pieces of identification that they also accepted. The only idea I had was that bogus doctor badge pinned to the lab coat I was still wearing. Plus, there's the one other minor problem. We also don't have tickets, I whispered to Peckerman. We are now standing on a line of excited vacationers awaiting their turns to board. But we do have a gun, <clears throat> said Peckerman, discreetly lifting his sweater, revealing the handle sticking out the top of what I can only imagine was the worst-smelling pair of dockers in the tri-state area, any tri-state area. And exactly what are you planning to do with it, Peckerman? Boat Jack, the SS Wind song. Something about his expression alarmed me. Just for the record, Packerman, that was intended to be a rhetorical question, I told him. Besides, you see that metal detector at the top of this ramp? Well, from everything I've read, guns are made of metal. His expression still alarmed me. Will you be talking soon, Peckerman? Because this line is moving quickly, and I'd like to know if you're about to do something incredibly stupid so I can get off and pretend I never met you, which has been my profound regret since I met you. Look, is all he said before nodding at an angle that sent my gaze downward toward the open beach bag of the couple in front of us. An elderly man and woman whose tickets for this very cruise were sitting on top of a towel and next to a few pairs of sunglasses and tubes of copper tone. I looked at Peckerman again, and yes, his expression still alarmed me when he held his finger up to his lips. Everyone moved forward, and when 
and we were now third in line for having to show our travel documents. It alarmed me even more so when he furtively placed his hand on the gun and started whistling Camp Town Races in a way I can only describe as the way a person would whistle Camp Town Races when he doesn't want anyone to think that he has a gun. He has his hand on a gun. But his hand went there much longer because just around the time that his whistling reached the second oh do do da day, the line was moving forward again and Packerman in one fluid motion bent over, dropped the gun into the older woman's beach bag and rose to a standing position with their tickets in hand just as she and her husband went through the metal detector. And while it wasn't worth describing every detail of the ensuing commotion involving about six security guards descending out of nowhere on two flailing elderly people crying, we have no idea how to get in there, as they were carried off and packed into a special bus that took them to some place. <clears throat> that I'm sure was unpleasant. Peckerman, sighing as if he was growing impatient by this delay, pushed me through the metal detector and waved the tickets along with his and the old man's passport to an apologetic captain or admiral or chef or whoever the hell he was perfunctorily waving, whoever he was who perfunctorily waved us onto the SS Winsong. How the hell did you pull that off, I asked as we walked through a sliding door and entered a large reception area where flutes of champagne and a carnival of hors d'oeuvres greeted the passengers who helped themselves before drifting down carpeted hallways in search of their accommodations. Come on, let's find our room and then we can come back for food, he said, as if that was an answer to my question. We took an elevator up to the H level, which was the most upper deck on the ship. It was also the most exclusive. My gosh, we said in unison. When we opened the door to room H22 and stepped into the stateroom that had a living room, bedroom, a marbled master bathroom, and a steam shower, two flat screen TVs, doors that stepped out onto a private balcony overlooking the water. Sue and Arnie really know how to live, said Peckerman. Ho, Sue and Arnie Cogan, that incarcerated old couple who were kind enough to let us know this place Let us use this place for the next ten days. Hungry? Yes, I answer, but I'm also exhausted. Me too. So, we took naps. Packerman won the coin toss, so he took the king-size bed, and I was just fine sacking out on the fold-out from the couch in the sitting area, sitting room. And when we woke up, we were at sea, cruising the Atlantic, away from the police, and from the news reporters with our pictures and 800 phone numbers to call for spot in. I took a steam shower and shaved <clears throat> using the razor and shaving cream that was in the complimentary toiletry bag on the counter next to the sink. Peckerman didn't shower or shave or even wash his hands after he used the bathroom for a really long time. The guy was a walking sun pump. Let's explore the ship, I suggested. Sure. So we left the stateroom and went down the elevator to the main deck. Through the casino where dozens of people were playing blackjack and roulette and pulling down the arms and slot machines now that we were beyond the three-mile limit where it was legal to gamble. Past the stores where dozens of people were shopping for jewelry and books and sunscreen. And then into the dining room where dozens of people were seated on were seated or online helping themselves to an unbelievable assortment of the foods from many nations being offered as a buffet lunch. It was then, because I couldn't take it any longer, that I turned to Peckerman and asked, have you noticed something out of the ordinary about every single person we've seen so far? You mean that they're all naked? You noticed it too, huh? Yep, Peckerman... And I were now stowaways on a quote-unquote clothing optional cruise on its way to the Caribbean islands.
Chapter 20, Jeffrey. Horkman pulled me over next to a salad bar the size of a war canoe. We have to get naked, he said. No, I said. Yes. We'll look at a pair of homos. Okay, first of all, that's very offensive. Why, are you a homo? No, I am not a gay American. Me neither. That's why I don't want to look like a fucking homo. His face got red and he raised his voice. Listen, he said. There is nothing wrong with two men having an intimate physical relationship. It's perfectly... He stopped there because the woman who'd been grazing her way down the salad bar had stopped and was looking at us. <clears throat> she was in, I'm guessing, her late 50s or early 60s. A large woman with hair the color of a traffic cone and large tits. I'm usually a fan of bazooms, but <clears throat> not when they're resting on a tray that's also supporting what look like four pounds of potato salad. He's right, she said to me. What, I said. Your friend is right. On this ship, we don't judge others. If you want to explore your sexual identity, this is the place for it. Lady, I said, number one, I'm not a faggot. Number two, butt out. Now her face is the color of her hair. What did you say? She said. A guy came up behind her, skinny, wrinkled dude who weighed maybe as much as one of her thighs. He was holding a banana. Something wrong, honey, he said. This man, she said, nodding her head toward me as being very offensive. The guy stepped between us, giving me the eyeball. Is there a problem, he said. He's trying to look badass, but that's a look a guy can't pull off when he's built like olive oil and he's naked except for banana. Which, for the record, not that I made a point of looking, it's just the way the angles lined up. It's a good five inches longer than his dick. I wasn't talking to you, I told him, nodding at his wife. I was talking to the manatee here. His hand tightened on the banana. What did you call her, you said? Christ, I said, is everybody on this boat deaf? We're just leaving, said Horkman. He grabbed my arm and pulled me toward the dining room exit. I looked back. Banana and saggy tights were talking to a crew member and pointing our way. We ducked out the door, hustled to the elevator, and went back to the cabin. Listen, said Horkman, you can't draw attention to us like that. I didn't say anything. The asshole was right. We have to fit in, he said. He was taking off his pants. That's our plan, I said. Get naked, that's it. For now, he said, still undressing. We lay low on the ship. Let things cool down in New York. <clears throat> we get to the Caribbean, get off on an island down there, call our families, we get lawyers, get this whole mess straightened out. He was naked now, he went to the door. I don't know about you, he said, but since we're stuck on this ship for now, I'm going to try to get something positive out of the experience. I believe there's a lecture on Japanese flower arranging in the sea urchin salon in 20 minutes. He opened the door, stepped out into the hallway, and closed the door behind him. Homo, I said, and began undressing. Chapter 21, Philip. There are precious few activities that grown men should do while naked. Showering, swimming when no one else is around, sex whether someone else is around or not, and anything that takes place in front of blind people. Beyond that, <clears throat> All unclothed activities performed in the presence of those who are sighted should be filed under the heading of Dear Lord. If he bends over one more time, I'm going to hang myself. So as much as I thought it was a good idea that Peckerman and I blend in with everyone else aboard this floating genital convention, <clears throat> I have to spend the next hour taking a Japanese flower arranging lesson because it's to reason that even if there were other men in this class, they would be seated. I was right. There were 12 other nude flower lovers in the room where the class was taking place. <clears throat> All women. Even the instructor who stood in the open area in the middle of the desks arranged in a circle was a woman. I don't mind telling you I found it fascinating that if someone had asked me what my reaction would be, if I'd ever found myself in an enclosed space with 13 stark naked women. <clears throat> I would have said something along the lines of, I should only be so lucky. 
But as I sat there, I found that the novelty wore off shortly after checking out the bodies that surrounded me. And I was surprisingly unexcited, with the exception of the extremely attractive woman who was sitting to my right. Although I didn't realize I was staring at her till she looked at me and smiled. First time, she asked. Yes, I said, in an attempt to subtly deny that I was obviously what I was obviously doing. I have never taken a Japanese flower arranging class before. She smiled some more, the kind of smile that told me that I was not off the hook. I mean, is this your first clothing optional cruise? Yes, I answered, <clears throat> totally embarrassed. <coughs> upon getting busted like this. I'm sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable. And then she... She laughed like someone who understood. It will take you a little while, she explained, but you'll get used to it. I figured she was in her mid-30s. With a slight accent. Boston? Portugal? So you've done this sort of thing before, I asked? I'm very much a naturalist, she said, nodding. It's a great equalizer. No clothes or uniforms, no telltale signs of wealth or social standing. On this ship, you've got doctors, school teachers, bank presidents, gas station attendants. You can't tell who's who until you get to know them as people. It's nicer that way. I like this naked woman a lot, and not just because she was naked. I liked her because she was one of those people who... By the way she looked at you when she spoke, made you want to speak. Made you feel safe to say what you wanted to, what you had to. And that's what I had to do. Until that very moment I hadn't had a conversation. I mean, an honest heart-to-heart dialogue with another human being. Parentheses Peckerman was of another species. About what had happened and how I felt about it since this entire ordeal Started the night before, and I was ready. Ready to talk about all the running and shooting in hospitals and big black bears and policemen's punctured scrotums that were pent up inside me. And now that I was finally in an idled state, was ready to express. So as the naked instructor passed out azaleas, zami, sakuras, and other Japanese flowers for us to work with, I had a feeling it wouldn't take much prompting from the old woman to my right for me to start spilling my guts. Aren't these flowers colorful? That's all the prompting I needed. Yes, they're quite colorful, and you wouldn't believe what's going on in my life right now. I didn't stop talking to her for the next hour. The floodgates had opened, and the outpouring could have buried a medium-sized village. Careful to keep my voice below a whisper, I started with the soccer game and took her straight through to how Peckerman still hadn't bathed, how much I missed Daisy and the kids, and how I was silently praying that Hyo, the 16-year-old Korean-American who worked for me after school and on weekends to mind the register and assist customers, would have the good sense to feed the animals at the wine shop when he sees that I hadn't been there. She listened, and I could tell she heard every word. What a refreshing phenomenon that was, after so many years of marriage, to say words that were actually heard. Neither of us even attempted to make a flower arrangement, and when the class was over, we took a walk along the outside deck, where naked people were talking, were taking in the last few rays of a setting sun, playing shuffleboard, swimming, and sipping pre-dinner cocktails. And while the conversations we overheard were pretty much about the beautiful weather, they also mentioned a forecast of rain and high winds that was that were supposedly ahead of us. <clears throat> we had no destination, but we stayed with each other because it seemed like the most natural thing to do as if this was merely the silent walking portion of the same conversation we were having in the flower arranging class. And for either of us to say goodbye, it was nice talking to you, would have been one of the moment and rude. I then followed her through an opening that took us back into the ship, then 
down a carpeted hallway until she slowed down and came to a stop in front of the door to a room on the G level. She turned to me, but we remained silent. Furtive side glances up and down the corridor revealed no one else around. We were alone. I looked at her again. She was really beautiful. Do you feel better after telling me what you did? I do. I know it doesn't change the situation, she said, nodding, but sometimes something always happens when our words hit the air. The emotions are shed, and what's left are the bare facts that we have to deal with in a logical manner. It's a big step. She exuded an air of calm radiance. She made me feel calm and, okay, radiant. And please know that your secret is safe with me, she added. Thank you. I suddenly felt a stirring, the kind of stirring that a red-blooded naked man tends to feel when he's standing maybe one foot away from a beautiful naked woman in an empty carpeted corridor. I don't know, Shiner. And I'd like you to feel free to speak to me if and when the need hits you again. Okay. And for what it's worth, I believe you. I believe in your innocence. It's worth a lot, I said, while wondering if she noticed my stirring. Listen, I then heard myself saying, you were so nice to listen to me, but I never gave you a chance to tell me about yourself. She smiled in a way that told me it was okay. My name is Maria. I'm Philip Horkman. Nice to meet you, Philip Horkman. I was now wondering if she was having a story of her own. I couldn't tell. I could never tell. To this very day, I never met any man who can tell. You're so easy to talk to, Maria. Comes with the territory. Make people feel comfortable so they tell me what's troubling them. Are you a therapist? No, I'm a nun.